Hello, everybody. Welcome to this Expert Insights uh, webinar that we've got for you today. What a topic we have. I've been so looking forward to this one. Thriving in uncertainty, strategic priorities of top leadership teams. And we are so, so blessed to have a world-leading thought leader here, uh, Leo Tillman, uh, who we'll introduce in a moment. Welcome, Leo. Great to be here, Mike. I've been so looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, so welcome everybody to our Renaissance Executive Forum's uh, members and to our non-members. And we are all about a global community of best-in-class CEOs and executives in forums and an ecosystem of collective intelligence. And to supercharge that, we invite fantastic uh, perspectives and experience and wisdom from folks like Leo here uh, to supercharge our global collective intelligence. And let me tell you, Leo knows his stuff. Just listen to this. He's a leading authority on strategy, risk intelligence, I really like that phrase, and finance, uh, advising companies, governments, and institutional investors all over the world, previously with BlackRock, Bear Stearns, and has served as an adjunct professor of finance at Columbia University. He's written four books, so he's put me to shame. Uh, the latest one, of course, was my favorite uh, in 2019, uh, the book Agility, which I have right here. It's a fantastic read, everybody, uh, that he co-authored with General Chuck Jacoby, former commander of NORAD and U.S. Northern Command. Uh, before that, he wrote a really interesting book called Financial Darwinism, uh, Darwinism and, uh, in 2008, and, and a few years before that, a risk management book in the year 2000. Uh, in 2010, in collaboration with the Nobel economist Edmund Phelps, he co-authored the Harvard Business Review proposal to create the first national bank of innovation, and in 2012, uh, uh, with European Financial Review article, he reshaped the concept of risk intelligence, positioning as an essential new competency of companies and investors. Uh, and he is one of the main architects of a public-private partnership involving the White House Rural Council, the USDA, and, uh, and the farm credit system that brought billions of dollars of private capital to innovative, innovative companies and projects uh, he's a, he's uh, acknowledged as a business visionary by Forbes, and he's even been honored by the World Economic Forum. We have the right guest today. We are so blessed to have you, Leo. Uh, you thank too. you so much for taking the time to be with us in our community. You're too kind. Too kind. <laughs> so, look, um, you and I could speak for days on this topic because everybody knows that agility is a passion of mine, and, and maybe we will speak for days, uh, but we've got an hour so far. So let's jump right in. You know, uh, Leo, in your work around agility, um, what is it that is front of mind for CEOs and executives like our members and non-members listening here to be more agile? What, what, what's top of mind for them? You know, Mike, when, when you pose a question like this uh, to senior leaders, they, first they go to human capital, just, just because it's the topic du jour and we have obviously the great resignation, we have challenges with engaging workforces, given what happened over the past couple of years, we have war for talent, where it's difficult to retain and, uh, and attract certain time. But, but a lot of this, and some of this is strategic in nature, when you position your organizations to compete in certain markets or in certain fields, but most of it is tactical. It's how do you overcome the challenges of the day? But when you steer this conversation into more strategic ground and you say, when you look at this environment of uncertainty, disruption, accelerated change, what comes to mind? They will typically uh, go into three areas, which, which they all phrase differently, but they all in, in the same realm. The first one is this notion that as a leadership team, we're constantly behind the curve. One crisis after another, one disruptive competitor after another. I, I'm sure everybody on this webinar recognizes that feeling. Yeah. And, and, and it, it stems from a number of places, right? One is there's just so much going on that detecting environmental changes that really matter from a strategic perspective is tough. 
and yeah. it requires a concerted effort. And some of it comes from the senior management team. And some of it will come from the edges of the organization, from the trenches, right? Who will see some of these, these ambiguous signs for environmental changes very early on. So, so the story of how Goldman Sachs navigated the global financial crisis of 08 and 09 is precisely that. It's, it, it, the, the changes were noticed both at the edges of the organization right. and the leadership team all came together, created a uh, pretty, pretty effective response. So being behind the curve in the broadest sense across all of these dimensions, I think yep. is one big, big area. The second one is this notion is because we are so under pressure and we're so behind the curve, we often make suboptimal decisions or we're indecisive and we kick the can down the road. We can dive into that uh, certainly, but but it stems from some of the disconnects between strategy and planning or strategy and risk. It stems from the fact that when you analyze strategic alternatives, you're missing some of the key dimensions of, of risk and so on. And the last one, <clears throat> which is a catch-all, but, but I think everybody would relate to it, is misalignment. And you know it. Uh, you know that something is not coming together within your organization. And it could be how we work as a leadership team or how we are incentivized within our silos versus on the enterprise level. Or we are amazing as a leadership team the moment this starts cascading down the organization becomes very ambiguous and ineffective. So these are some of the big topics and some of the big challenges that um, are constantly coming up yeah. in our work. And of course, they're amplified by everything that is going on. Yeah. And, and you know, when I was introducing you and, and um, as you and I have interacted over recent days and weeks, I really love this concept of risk intelligence, um, not least of all because I started my career, Leo, working on offshore oil and gas drilling rigs. And you have to be incredibly intelligent about risk. Other really bad stuff happens. Tell us more about this risk intelligence piece and the, the suboptimal decision making that, that's occurring if we're not careful. Sure. And, and look, it's such a great uh, precursor to agility. And, and I'll explain. So <clears throat> I was very fortunate to meet uh, General Chuck Jacoby. And uh, thanks to him and all the veterans today on, on Veterans Day. Um, and, and what we realized very quickly is that we've been tackling the set, same sets of issues for a very long time from totally different perspectives, from totally different um, sets of risks and opportunities, obviously one in battlefield command and homeland security, one is in business and finance. But, but it was all about what does this mean and what does this take to react to change? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we were very frustrated from our perspectives that how buzzworthy, buzzworthy this, this conversation has been <laughs> in terms of you know, yeah, there is accelerating change. We need to be more flexible and then dynamic and adaptable and anti-fragile, right. so on and so forth. But what does this really mean in practical terms? And what is the difference, say, between being adaptable and being agile? And and there was a great deal of ambiguity and and imprecision. So 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 what we wanted to do is to formally define this quality, this elusive quality, call agility, and then really deconstruct it and say here's yeah. how you would go and cultivate yeah. it within the organization yeah. but but do yeah. you talk about risk intelligence it goes back to my entire career you know i joined wall street in the early 90s when when all of these weird quants <clears throat> present company included um <laughs> were coming and developing models and systems <laughs> the first task right the first task was do we even understand what are the dimensions of risk, right? And secondly, the question became, how do we measure our exposures to them? So super complicated models came into play. But once that, mm -hmm. that was done uh, by, say, early 2000s, uh, the question became, okay, so now that we know the universe of risks, sort of, and we have various ways to estimate it, what do we do with that? So, yeah. so, so financial Darwinism essentially said, look, it's very difficult to have this conversation when you're talking about balance sheets or income statements or org charts or business models. But, but if you sort of take a different lens 
And you think about um, any organization or enterprise as a portfolio of risks and a portfolio right. of interconnected risks, then the question becomes, how dynamically are you managing that portfolio? Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and so, so all of the uh, visible failures and visible successes were really about how do you think about that portfolio and how actively you manage it, which brings us to agility, which is just the next step of it, right? Yeah. It's, uh, it's a broader conversation, but, but dynamism of how you react to changing environments is at the heart of it. So, so here's our definition of agility. It's the organizational capacity to effectively detect, assess, and anticipate, and respond to change. But we wanted to really distinguish it from defensive, reactive, tactical detection, assessment, and response. So we added these three super loaded terms, purposeful, unified around an objective, having a clear true north, decisive, ability to make timely decisions in a very conscious way in having the will to win, which is a combination of resilience and the bias for offense, where we're not constantly on the defense. We are shaping the marketplace. We're shaping the environment. So we can we can di uh, uh, sort of dive into all of this. But but the moment we did that, we, re we realized there are two different kinds of agility. One is strategical, a strategic, right? And that's a purview of leadership teams. And that's when they detect major changes in the marketplace and then reposition the whole organization to it. And another one is a tactical one where you dispatch the whole organization to execute. And in that process, they will they too will have uh, challenges and surprises. So how good are they at their level with their set of tools? at detecting, assessing, anticipating, and responding while executing our strategy. And super interesting connection emerged with this entire world of agile that came from an entirely right. different direction and was designed for entirely different purposes. But we realized that uh, agile was a very powerful way to create tactical agility. So, so that kind of separation was really uh, useful in sort of detecting what organizations were trying to do, what they were struggling with, and really focusing attention on that. Yeah. Wow, that's uh, fantastic. Uh, and and uh, there's so many insights and angles and dimensions to that already. And I'm, I'm really imagining our members and non-members um, sitting, listening to us here who are CEOs or executives, and they're kind of sat, you know, in the driving seat, if you like, of their business. And I loved your use of the word portfolio and just imagine the portfolio of opportunities, challenges, risks, rewards, issues, strategic to tactical, short-term to long-term, leadership stuff, management stuff. If we're not careful, um, certainly on a bad day, we kind of lose the will to win, don't we? We kind of feel overwhelmed by all of this. How on earth can I get my head around all of this, my arms around all of this, and and keep you know moving things forward to to define our future so that our future doesn't define us? This is just fantastic, Leo. In terms of the the challenge that our members face, and you, you know that you you know we talk about collective intelligence, and and when I think about that, I think about risk intelligence, reward intelligence. How do we how do we sort of tap into opportunities? And, and how does that come together sort of collectively, organization-wide, organization-deep? That's a massive challenge that it is so easy for people to oversimplify, isn't it? It's very complex. It, it is very complex. But, but uh, one point that you raised, I really want to emphasize. We are simultaneously talking about mitigation of threats and capturing of opportunities every time yeah. we say the word risk, right? So, so in finance, you would probably not call certain things risks, you would call risk factors, right? Changes in interest rates, changes in equity markets, changes in uh, foreign currency rates, right? And each one of them has the upside and the downside, right? So so this will to win, the bias for offense, um, turning adversity into opportunities, all about this simultaneous 
management of both the downside and the upside. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in that really that, that really transforms the mindset and cultures and conversations within organizations. Yeah. Where all of a sudden, you know, risk management does not necessarily mean risk aversion or risk mitigation. Right. Right? Right. It, it means simultaneous optimization on of, of both sides. So so risk intel so the complaint, the traditional complaint about risk management was that it was overly focused on the downside, right? And that it was often backward looking in the way that people thought about problems, measured problems, et cetera. So risk intelligence uh, was modeled after competitive intelligence or business intelligence, where it's all forward looking and it's all decision oriented, right? Where the goal is to optimize decisions and in this particular case, by managing both the downside and the upside. So, so not surprisingly, risk intelligence uh, and risk in general dominates this entire conversation about agility, even though it's a much broader topic, right? Yeah, I love that. Both capabilities in leadership and culture. Would that be useful to quickly talk about that? Yes, please. Yeah, that sounds great. So, 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 so every, every word, uh, in this definition, took an inordinate amount of time to <laughs> I can imagine <laughs> uh, to the frustration of everyone involved. And it, it, it's like people did, didn't understand how you can spend days on one word, right? But it was important, right? So, <clears throat> what does it mean to detect in environmental change? Well, first of all, it means that you need to very carefully study the environment and understand different facets of the environment before you're even capable of detecting that something has changed. Something has changed in the field of technology, or it's a new paradigm with China and Taiwan, or there is a um, market dislocation brewing, or whatever the case may be, right? So detection is a combination of study of the environment and a framework for detection, which happen, which can happen either at the edges of the organization or uh, among the leadership team. Assessment is what you make of it, right? How do you evaluate these changes and how do you evaluate strategic uh, implications? Anticipation is all about planning, right? It's not about prediction of the future, which nobody can do, but it's about creating the capability and culture so that you can, you can understand a range of scenarios and detect which scenario is being realized. And, and, and response is about not just execution of the strategy, but it's, a, it's about the universe of levers that you can use to respond to any particular situation. I, I, was, I was speaking to a board member of a number of very large and complex organizations the other day, and her point was that a lot of the responses of the past two years, in her words, were blunt, right? They were, they were not nuanced. They were not... Right custom tailored to a specific situation. Right. They were like, oh, recession is coming. Let's fire a whole bunch of people, exit these businesses, shrink the balance sheet, right? I mean, as opposed to having a conversation of um, what should we shrink and where should we expand um, to capture opportunities yeah. during the crisis and so on and so forth. So, so this conversation about the universe of levers that we have as a management team, as a as a group, right, um, is a very important one because they span business tools, organizational tools, um, and they span risk tools, right? Because risk appetite and how you uh, dial it up and down and how you allocate it across different types of risks or assets are really powerful levers to respond to uh, during the crisis. So, so that's the response part. The, the other three have to do with culture and mindset, but but it was it was interesting because you know coming from our backgrounds we we often think about capabilities right in analytical frameworks like what is the process and what are the analytical tools for detection or what is our decision making framework for assessment etc. But the moment you start this conversation, you realize how much culture and leadership uh, factor into it, right? So for instance, you have an organization that where leaders um, sort of punish bad news, right? So how effective will this organization be in detecting change, 
if people are afraid to bring right. bad news to the decision makers or we're in the period of assessment and we're debating like two two or three years ago we started to talk to our clients about the possibility of stagflation right and at that point it was not even on radar screens and people had very difficult time articulating what it would mean for their for their businesses and balance sheets so you're in the room okay and you're saying you know there's enough data points now that this could become a trend and if that becomes a trend it's it has real significant implications so now imagine this conversation where in an organization where you have a dominant uh ceo or dominant right. leadership team who essentially will make fun of everybody and suppress dissent well you will never get to the bottom of it and same applies to every every other term so so very very quickly we realized that to create agility, you need a set of really advanced, sophisticated capabilities, but but without the right culture and the right mindset and the right leadership style, none of this is going to work. So, so we have to go back and forth. And that was a really interesting uh, angle to it. Yeah. Wow. I'm loving it. And, and I'm loving the fact, which is where we'll go in a moment, that we're arriving at really the crux of the matter, everybody, which is your leadership and the culture that you create and reinforce positively or negatively if you're not careful. And uh, before we go there, though, I think this slide that we were just looking at, and we, we don't need to go back there, there, there are two concepts on the slide that I really love. In the tactical area, it was speed of the challenge. And in the strategic area, it was speed of relevance. And I think that speaks to the practical uh, reality that our members face every day, uh, Leo. And that is they're so busy dealing with the speed of the challenge and the craziness of every day, every week, every month. Uh, and, and just trying to sort of survive that, uh, working in the business, as it were, in the flow, that if they're not careful they're not spending enough time strategically and the speed of irrelevance can kick in probably bigger, faster, sooner than their worst nightmare if they're not careful. You, can you, you comment you, on that? You're absolutely right, Mike. And it's been so interesting. You walk into the organization and you, you, you're just starting to get to know it. And you show, you show this slide and you get pretty visceral re reactions to it. <laughs> and, and, and people will say, yep, th this is us. We are green. We live in the green, you know, and, or, you know what? 90% of the time we're in the green, 10% of the time we're in the blue and the, and there's no connection between the two. Right. right? Um, so, so it's amazing how much time was, has been spent on, on this slide. In, in very clearly also articulating where this world of agile lives, right? Yeah. Because agile is really, really powerful, but it's powerful yeah. in very specific applications. Yeah. We yeah. want to create cross-functional uh, cross teams who are empowered and have, don't have barriers and blah, blah, blah. Um, and we want them to innovate faster, or yeah. we want them to interact with clients faster so that we have better feedback, et cetera, et cetera, right? These are ways to, to solve very specific either product development problems or project management problems. Right. But when you start applying Agile, okay, in sending executive teams on scrums or whatever the case may be uh, to try to solve strategic problems, it, it invariably fails. Invariably, yeah. just because yeah. you're applying an entirely wrong set of tools to, yeah. to a very different kind of problem. So yeah, really, yeah. mentally separating it has been really useful. Yeah, I really like that. The fact that everybody's heard Agile. They've heard of Agile software development, Agile project management, maybe even some other Agile things. The word Agile gets put in front of a lot of things these days. And what you're juxtapositioning with that is the more holistic systemic mindset uh, positioning of agility as a much bigger th challenging thing. Is that right? Yeah, well, I think the two go hand in hand, right? right. I mean, we, we, we keep using examples where you could have an amazingly agile leadership team. They are all over 
uh, big trends. They, they're in the flow, they understand it, they have a vision of what kind of organization um, would thrive in, in an environment like this. And then they are these painful micromanagers, okay, who created the wrong culture and, and there's an army of robots, okay, trying to implement an agile repositioning. Well, that's definitely going to fail, right? Right. Um, the other way around will fail as well. You have an amazingly agile, flat organization. Everybody is empowered. Everybody is creative. They're all running around doing things. Um, there is absolutely no guarantee that the set of these really useful activities is going to comprise a strategy that is going to reposition you to a change in the environment. Yeah. So the two really are two sides of the same coin. Both are yeah. important, but both entail very different activities and leadership engagement and analytical tools. Um, and, and I think it's, it's, it becomes really powerful to say, look, yes, of course you need to embark on a digital transformation because you have inefficiencies, you have operational errors, you have, uh, inability to deliver certain um, client expectations and needs, but that's not going to reposition you, okay, for a world that is facing, say, deglobalization, right? right? Or it's not going to fundamentally change your exposure to China um, and supply chains. So, so the two are just entirely different. And and the danger is where people are saying, oh, we. We're already spending lots and lots of money and time on a digital right. transformation. We should be okay, right? Uh, so, so the confusion between what we do in strategically and tactically, I think, is is really important to to get to the bottom of. Yeah, and and everybody, I think, in some ways, what you're saying, Leo, is this chart is not an or proposition. It is not this or that. No, it's an and proposition of both. Not not necessarily fifty fifty, as it were, but you've got to be spending enough time in each of these zones aligned with each other. Otherwise, in some way, shape or form, you risk that it can all go wrong. Correct, Leo? Absolutely. So, so, so the connection to the military in this green box is a fascinating one because the military likes to use terms like command and control and so on. And in people's minds, it means stifling micromanagement, okay? And they say, well, that, that, that wouldn't work in this new world of flat organizations and empowerment right. and so on. Right. But it's a complete misconception because in the military, uh, and I'm talking about more like the army versus, you know, Air Force, but right. in the army, right? You kind of assume that at some point, people on the front lines are going to lose contact with, with the leadership. Right, just because of the the enemy is going to deny it, or something is going to change, etc. So they need to be able to operate independently, but but they need to be able to operate independently while still carrying out the strategy in execution. Right. So so this entire doctrine of mission command that goes back to Napoleon, out of all people, and then through Clausewitz and um, you know arriving here today is all about. How do you, as a leadership team, develop top-down vision, strategy, and priorities? And then how do you give guidance, resources, and authority to the rest of the organization to go and knock themselves out by being independent and creative? Uh, and, and ex so, so in the ideal situation, when you look at it from the outside, it looks like complete micromanagement because everybody is uh, rowing in the same direction, you know, but it, but in fact, the mechanism of how yeah. this is done is totally different. And, right. and from that perspective, I think it's more applicable to this world of new workforces, new organizations, new environments, better than ever, right? So, yeah. so this entire uh, conversation about organizational alignment, organizational guidance, how do you create tactical agility? How do you execute strategy in powerful, disciplined, creative ways? Um, that connection has been really, really interesting and very counterintuitive to, to yeah. a lot of folks. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that sort of brings us back around to the, to the crux of the matter, everybody, which is look in the mirror. Um, you know, the leadership and the culture that you have is a reflection of you. Is it agile or is it, 
you know, fragile. And, and that really is, is what you really got into in your book, uh, Leo. So tell us a little bit more about some of the broad themes, uh, some of the deeper leadership and cultural aspects. And, and obviously our members are sat there in the driving seat of their business, you know, of uh, mid-market companies or perhaps divisions of larger companies wondering, how do I begin to lean into this? Yeah, my, uh, my friend and co-author, General Jacoby, often says that we never set out to write a leadership book, but, <laughs> but we ran into issues of leadership and culture all the time, all the time. And we, we use this one example in the book. It's, uh, it's from the financial services industry, and it's about a company that blew up uh, during the financial crisis. We're not at liberty to say who that was, but um, we were asked by the board of directors to come in, uh, examine what happened, and then unwind the, the organization. And knowing the organization just in general uh, over the years, we expected that is going to be a super, super sophisticated conversation about, you know, market liquidity drying up or uh, contagion between asset classes kicking in, et cetera. And it was all about leadership. And it was all about when you started listening to the board and the employees and, they, and, and them saying, our leaders lost their way and they, they didn't have division, the they didn't listen to anybody, uh, they put themselves first. Uh, it was quite astonishing. It was quite yeah. astonishing. Same with many, many of these organizations, like when you think about Lehman and Bear Stearns and um, MF Global and Enron, right? I mean, in what's happening right now in the cryptocurrency world, right? I mean, yeah, the, the, there are some issues about valuation, but it seems very much about leadership and culture and the true north or the lack thereof, right? So, so, so it's been very, very interesting. And of course, the military has a great deal to add uh, about this topic, right? About leaders exemplifying what they're saying, right? Because if there is a disconnect, between official values that are on everybody's walls, the way leaders behave, well, then none of this is going to work out, right? Yeah. And, and that yeah. spans all of these um, areas. Are leaders empowering or are they micromanaging? Are they, do they convey that they're in the pursuit of truth or are they driven by politics? <clears throat> do they suppress dissent or do they welcome dissent, right? Um, are they authentic or not, right? And Bill George, for instance, has been amazing at articulating that latter point. Um, and I love his new book um, that applies a lot of these lessons to, to the new generations of people who are entering the workforce. So, yeah. so great deal of conversations, but, but, the, but the key key facets of cultures that can foster agility are honesty and pursuit of truth, um, accountability and empowerment and trust, yeah. right? Because again, detect cannot do without any of these. Assess cannot do any of these. Respond cannot do any of these, right? So culture of honesty, and we called it the, the forum of truth, right? As a, as a visual, right? We walk in into meetings when we are debating solutions or we had a human resources issue or whatever we're here to get to the truth and 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 our behavior and demeanor is conveying that right um we welcome dissenting dissenting views even if we may go the other way right and then this entire empowerment uh business is all about trust right because what we when are people creative and innovative and will go and be engaged, right? It's when they feel that we have their back, right? We as, as leader. So, so part of this entire business of alignment is about creating that trust that then in turn fosters uh, independent thinking and innovation. Wow, wow. I'm sure that our members are, are sitting here right now, Leo, making so many connections between the language that you're using and the language that we use obviously we already talked about risk intelligence and collective intelligence and you just used a phrase i think it was forum of truth and that's exactly 
uh, what we do in our forums. We call it a circle of trust, uh, a love forum of truth. It's like, it's like because, because all of these leadership and cultural capabilities that we're talking about are so nuanced, they're so systemic, they're so hard to see and, 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 and detect accurately, when our members walk into their forum of truth, their forum meeting, it's like walking into a hall of mirrors. And all of a sudden, their peers are holding up a mirror to them, perhaps more clearly than anywhere else they go, to really ask the questions of them, are you being the leader you need to be? Are you creating the culture you need to create? Are you finding this balance of the and proposition between the right-hand side of the chart and the left-hand side of the chart and all the alignment? So form of truth just speaks so loudly to us, Leo. Thank you for using that phrase. Yeah, and, and look, as I, as I got to know your organization and some of the other you know, executive networks, it's so important, right? It's so important to have that circle of trusted advisors internally within organizations and externally, right? Because the two are very complementary and, and needed, right? We we try to play that role, right, for for our clients. But but there is a great deal of a group of similarly positioned executives coming together and uh, speaking candidly about the kinds of challenges they have and how these challenges are playing in different industries and in different countries and settings and so on. So it's invaluable, just in general, right? Because um, that top-down detection of change, right, and detection of really important uh, changes in the market environment, these are hard, right? And and yes, some of them are invaluably detected by the edges of the organization, where someone is talking to a client and the client mentions something in passing, and they're like, "Oh my God, I think the entire industry is going to be repositioned," versus right? Speaking to executives in different industries and saying something is up because it just sounds too too familiar. So I agree with you. And, and this business of intelligence, broadly speaking, has been very much on our minds because um, what we have noticed is that whether it comes to being behind the curve, right? Or whether it comes to <clears throat> making suboptimal decisions, a lot of the times this happens because the right intelligence is not in the room when the conversation is happening, right? I, I, I recall a conversation with one of the clients who was thinking about making a massive investment into a particular field of technology. And within that field of technology, there were many different subfields. And it was important to understand, like, wh wh which one of those subfields are we going to we're going to pick really complicated conversation. So, so <clears throat> we're in the room and the tech teams are presenting their recommendations about what subfields uh, this company should be invested in. And we say, okay, so you're making some of the illusion about the arm race of technologies across the globe. What do your clients think about X, Y, and Z? Don't know. Um, what does U.S. government think about that? Don't know. Um, are you able to attract talent, uh, given your brand, given your business model, uh, to be in those fields of technology? Don't know. <clears throat> so all of a sudden, right, a great deal of environmental context with the war for talent, geopolitics, macroeconomics yeah. is missing from the conversation. So how optimal is going to be that decision? And that decision is going to be really consequential because not only it involves significant amount of money that is going to be invested today, but the opportunity cost yeah. is enormous, right? So, so we see this over and over again and equipping, having a conversation with clients on what is the right set of intelligence factors that must be present. And then how do you create capabilities and process and, and uh, culture that brings it all together probably has been one of the most dominant conversations that we have. Yeah, had yeah. And I can, I can, I can hear people now saying, "I'm too busy to know. <laughs> I'm too busy dealing with the present to be doing all this research 
about the future and everybody what that means is if, if you pull the trigger on a decision you are essentially gambling are you not leo because you are just making a blind roll of the dice in an unintelligent to put it to put it mildly that was we call that collectively unintelligent i mean this is so day-to-day -day reality for our members leo it's like how on earth do i find a better balance than i have today this week last month last year the last five three years five years ten years i realize if i'm not careful i'm driving blind i'm flying blind well, you, you, as you may imagine, uh, over the years, we've spent quite a bit of time thinking about <clears throat> different metaphors. And as a matter of fact, in one of the articles we wrote right before the hell broke loose in 2020, we called, I think we called it the zoology of failure or something <laughs> along the lines. And, and we talked about flying blind and like sitting ducks and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, but it all gets to the point that... Um, if you are, if you lack situational awareness and you don't have all the right people and knowledge in the room when you're making some of these decisions, it's just bound to be ineffective. Um, so, so huge topic in a big need. So, 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 but to your point, um, a very senior executive uh, from Wall Street, um, who I've known for a very long time, called me up after reading Agility and he said, I have two takeaways. I, as a senior leader, I'm not spending enough time on intelligence and planning. Those, those are the two things. I'm so busy. I'm in that green box, okay, 24-7, fighting fires and so on. I'm, I'm realizing now that as an executive, it's imperative that I allocate much more significant amount of my time and my team's time on those two things, intelligence and planning. And, and interestingly enough, for General Jacoby and some of the colleagues that he brought to our firm, um, that's been the biggest revelation. When they, w w they've been three: um, the role of intelligence, the role of planning, and the role of leader development. Mm. Uh, and and those are the three things that, for someone who comes from uh, the military, is in the business of developing leaders, implementing strategy through planning, and constantly what we call in the book fighting for intelligence it's pretty astonishing to see you know some of the disconnects that that exist yeah yeah and, and this is just fueling our fire of our dedication and commitment to our global ecosystem of collective intelligence because we want our forums to be a one of the places amongst others, but a main place, a main source, a main pipeline of thought-provoking, uh, strategy-stimulating, collective intelligence of how is the future changing? I love, I love the, the, your concept of the edges of the organization. It's that idea of, uh, from, from agile software development, one of the sayings is that the future's already here. Mm -hmm. It's just not evenly distributed, everybody. It's already out there, but it's on the fringe. Mm -hmm. And so you have to sort of go to the fringe to be able to find it and see it and then start to think about, well, how does it apply to me before it arrives as a freight train? How does it apply to me in a way that I can have the agility to navigate around it, over it, under it, through it? Uh, uh, so it becomes a reward opportunity, not a risk threat to the future of my business. But, but so, let's pause on that because it's such a great, such a great example, right? So suppose there is a profound change that is appearing on the horizon, right? And someone in the trenches um, is exposed to it, right? Okay, number one, do they perceive themselves to be in the business? Right. Of noticing this, right? right? Or are they just like a robot who is doing a particular task, right? So one is the mindset, right? That must be cultivated where some of our clients called it, everybody is a risk intelligence receptor, right? Or, or, or however you want to describe it. But, but, but like everybody understands that they are an essential intelligence collection unit, right? Two, um, can they recognize that it's important, right? 
can they make a connection to what is the implication for our business? So, so if they see something, they talk to the head of HR and the head of HR says, I don't know. Um, but it's actually a business conversation that needs to be had with, with the COO, right? So second one is, is there a link between what they're seeing and, and their understanding of our strategy or our portfolio of risks? And three, do we have the right culture where they are incentivized and engaged and alert and not afraid, right, to have this conversation? So that's like right away, um, yeah. the knowledge, the capabilities, the process, the culture, uh, all come into play. Uh, but that's what it takes, right? That's yeah, what it yeah. To be, to be, to be seeing, to be listening out there on the fringes, and then uh, we we like to say our, our forums, uh, Leo, are simultaneously a safe and a brave place. It's it's a place where you can trust in the safety that you can bring anything, you can self disclose, you don't need to withhold anything. And in fact, be brave in doing so, uh, push the envelope, maybe go further, perhaps than you than you have been before, be brave, be courageous, be fearless, as you said earlier, um, to go there and, and everybody you know what that feels like. You know what that sounds like. You know what that looks like in your forum meetings if you're a REF member. The question for you now and how, and how agile the conversation flow, the, the, the intelligence can be in your cases and your discussions in your forum. The question now becomes, how do you take that into your business? How do you take it into your organization? How do you take that clarity, that that courage, that that um, determination? And um, I, I just love where you're taking um, how, how you're holding up a mirror, Leo, to our members to be pondering, hmm, how am I going to move the needle on my leadership presence? Yeah, and look, two, two, two key words, right? Safe and brave, right? And applies to your forums, applies to groups within organizations, and underlying both is trust, right? Yeah. Underlying yeah. both is is trust. So trust has emerged as a absolutely essential component, and and we see this over and over again how leadership styles or leadership authenticity um, really decimate trust um, over and over again, right? I mean, you see this over. Uh, and, and it's 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 really problematic. So so I think realization of the central role of trust in all of this is is critical. And you said another uh, word that is uh, that is so important, which is clarity, right? I mean, in and it starts with the clarity of vision, right? Not the one li one line or one sentence mission and vision statements, but <laughs> but a description into why are we doing what we're doing. What is what does success look like, right? And what are the broad parameters of how we're going to get there? Yeah. And amazingly, yeah. something this that sounds so self-evident and it's like, well, of course, it's it's not as easy and it's often missing. Yeah, right. It's, Without yeah. it, right? How do you going to go and empower and engage your organization to uh, to to go and do this, right? So, yeah. but, but I think the knowledge is there, the knowledge of the components of what, what makes companies agile and high performing is there. Yeah. Um, lots and lots of case studies. Um, I think we now have a roadmap on, on how to do that, but it requires courage, as you said, right? And focus and engagement, right? Leader. Yeah. So, so if we are consumed with fighting fires and, um, <laughs> traveling around and doing whatever, right? That means we're not spending time on shaping our culture, creating that vision, uh, planning, and and that's the, that's the trade-off. Yeah, and one of the things I like to say, Leo, is sometimes if we're not careful, we are so busy fighting fires, we don't have time to install a fire prevention system. And so we're gonna, we're gonna serve a life sentence, everybody, in jail forever just working in the tactical side of the equation that Leo showed earlier, because we're not working sufficiently 
spreading our bandwidth onto the strategic side of the equation. And I just can't get over that whole speed of relevance concept and the speed of irrelevance, which is the sort of inverse of it. And how many times, Leo, do we have sort of 2020 hindsight? Oops, we're now in a crisis uh, of our business model or our, our client service or our talent management or or just our, our the efficacy of, of, of what we offer. Uh, we got disrupted in some way, shape, or form by a freight train that came over the horizon bigger, faster, sooner than we thought. Yeah. And we have that blinding flash of 2020 hindsight, and we think, oh, we didn't think of that. We didn't ask that question. We didn't see that coming. In fact, that saw us coming like a fool. And we were being busy fools if we're not careful. This is a really hard challenge for, for leaders. And I, and I used the word mindset earlier. I mean, obviously, it, it kind of starts up here, doesn't it? We've got to flick a few switches up here to change our mindset that we can do this, but we're going to have to show up differently. Is that right? Yeah. And, and, uh, and we've discovered a few approaches that have proven to be really, really great right. in, this, in this direction. So, so here's one, okay? So suppose we're we're talking about um, developing a certain set of new capabilities and uh, re reshaping our culture in certain directions along the lines that we're discussing, right? Yeah. The question becomes, suppose we did that. And suppose we had that, um, say, in 2019, right? Or in 2010, or right before the global financial crisis. What would be different? Right. So so these types of exercises where we sort of visualize, OK, so we're thinking about moving our organization in this direction. Let's rewind the game tapes and let's play this out. Like what would we have noticed differently? Right. What kind of how would we shape decisions differently? How would we um, spearhead our organization differently? It's been really, really powerful because it, it helps you understand that some of the mistakes that you were referring to uh, could have been avoided. And here's how the capabilities under consideration would have specifically uh, achieved. Yeah. So uh, Leo, as we begin to come down to time here, and I'll, I'll keep my eye on the, on the comment uh, chat here to see if there's any other questions. Um, could you keep going along those lines? So that could be, that could be something that our members or non-members who are listening to this could could start to think about doing, hey, you know what, maybe I should be doing some sort of retrospectives back in time and asking ourselves how we might have navigated that situation differently and maybe our portfolio of risks and rewards would have ended up in a different place if we'd been spooled up in this kind of mindset. So that's something that they could start to do. What other sort of um, one or two practical things could they think about doing, you know, next week, next month, next quarter? Um, so one question I would encourage everybody to ask internally is, do we have the clarity needed to navigate this environment? Yeah. Right? And, and of course, you can spend three days of an executive retreat 24 seven on this one. Topic, right? <laughs> right. Uh, and, and, and there are so, super interesting ways to, to, uh, so navigate it. Like, uh, you throw a question, Hey, um, guys, before we dive into things, what business are we in? Okay. And watch that conversation. Right. And we, we, which has so many layers and so many, um, um, sort of nuances. When we describe su success, what horizon are we using? Are we using one horizon? Are we using many horizons? Because um, right. if we are optimizing everything for the next quarter, well, that could be problematic. But if we're optimizing something for the next three years, okay, that could be problematic too in, 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 in other ways. So clarity, strategic clarity, clarity of vision, of priorities, direction, I think is one big, big area. The second one is this page, which is what, what are the biggest challenges that we face in which bucket do they belong in? 
Right. Because that would help clarify the set of tools and conversations that need to happen. I think you could spend the entire executive retreat on this page alone, right? And, and, and have conversations about what are we doing strategically? What are we doing tactically? How do the two come together? Uh, are we substituting uh, tactical for strategic or vice versa, right? And, and then the third one is, I think it's, it's about a declaration of what type of company do we want to be? Mm-hmm. Not in terms of products and services, but in terms of agility. Like, are we a company that has the will to win? Are we a company that is really good at adapting to change versus it's a company that shapes the environment, shapes the competition. We are on the offense. Um, we dominate marketplaces, right? So so those are the kinds of conversations Beautiful. I think would go, go yeah. really okay. Beautiful. Well, uh, let's sort of finish where we started on that whole concept of the will to win, everybody. And how blessed have we been, Leo, to hear from you today around concepts that just connect so strongly with who we are and what we do and, and how we show up and the, the whole connection of intelligence between risk intelligence and collective intelligence, the whole connection between a form of truth. I just love that. And, and, and a circle of trust that we do. And, and the whole connection between Sorry to interrupt you there. There seems to be something wrong with your microphone and you sound a bit like a robot. Uh, nope. Yeah, it, it, it was difficult to hear you, Mike, but the body language said it all, okay? <laughs> I, I, I think everybody understand, understood every word you said. So, so look, uh, it, really a pleasure. Pleasure to be with all of you. Uh, you're doing an amazing job with uh, with your executive networks, and I hope this was useful. Uh, you, you know, you tapped into some of the most engaging and important issues that we tackle and we think about 24/7. So I hope it was useful to to everybody. And feel free to reach out to me and uh, look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you.